Good afternoon. My name is Burton Lim, ROM Assistant Curator of Mammals and Curator for the Special Exhibition, Wildlife Photographer of the Year. I'm delighted you can join us for today's Curated Conversations, a digital program that explores themes and subjects from ROM collections alongside industry professionals. We have received ongoing support of this program from TD, so thank them for their continued assistance. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the ROM sits on what is being the ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabek Nation, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, since time immemorial to today. The program today is in support of our current exhibition, Wildlife Photographer of the Year, which is currently showing at ROM until May 29th. WPY, as we affectionately call it, is developed and produced by the Natural History Museum in London, England. We would like to acknowledge the support of Royal Exhibition Circle donors in making this exhibition possible. WPY is based on the Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition that attracted more than 50,000 submissions this year from both amateur and professional photographers of all ages. Exhibition stunning images allow visitors to experience nature in vivid detail and get up close to some of the world's most extraordinary species, the lives they live, and the challenges they face. Wildlife Photographer of the Year offers an internationally acclaimed platform to showcase stunning images while celebrating our beautiful planet and encouraging us all to think about the impacts we have on our shared home. Before we begin, a warning that some guests may find some of these images and content upsetting. But without further ado, please join me in welcoming my guest for today's program, award-winning photographer, Gil Vizen. Gil is a naturalist who has a great affection for small creatures. He enjoys tracking and observing wildlife, nature photography, and breeding arthropods. Having earned a Master of Science in Zoology and Entomology, his expertise includes taxonomy, behavior, and rearing, as well as medical and forensic entomology. Gil's mission is to dispel concerns and misconceptions surrounding insects and spiders. His award-winning photos have been featured in numerous magazines, books, newspapers, and broadcast media. He is also a science communicator who is involved in creating educational programs and exhibition displays using live arthropods. He has worked closely with the University of Toronto and ROM, as well as other museums, science centers, and zoos in North America. We will begin with a conversation around Gil's work on photography and the lesser known invertebrates. During the program, please submit your questions via the Q&A feature on your screen, and we'll have some time at the end to answer these. So please join me in welcoming Gil Vizen to the conversation. Hi, Gil, how are you? Hi, Burton. And hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining in. Uh, OK, so uh, let's get uh, right into it. So most people like myself photograph the showier and large mammals and birds. So what drew you to the smaller creatures on Earth? I think with this question alone, I can probably fill up the entire conversation because um, there are many, many reasons to uh, uh, to like smaller animals, uh, but I'm, I'm going to try and keep it short. Um, I find these animals absolutely fascinating. Uh, they're interesting. They lead interesting lives. Um, but and they also they're also um, ecologically and economically important. Some of those uh, animals are pests, and some other animal, some of other um, are. Um, biological control agents of these pests. So it, there's a lot to, to, uh, to unpack here. Um, but I think the main reason why I'm attracted, so attracted to um, smaller animals and especially arthropods, so arthropods, insects, and arachnids, is because they are underrepresented. Um, most of the focus is on what we call charismatic megafauna. So all the larger animals like mammals and birds. And that's understandable. Um, they are somewhat similar to us. They are larger, so we can relate to them um, easier. Um, but when we pause for a second and, and think about the larger picture, 
um, we have a very skewed view of the natural world because of this. When you compare the megafauna and all the, the rest, basically all the other animals, um, there is this very uh, big difference. Uh, most of the biomass, so the number and mass of animals, and also the diversity is actually where the, um, the arthropods and the smaller animal, um, small animals are. Um, so basically, it's a skewed view, and it's not a, a true representation of what we have in nature. Uh, so that's why I picked that group as my main focus. I think uh, they have a lot to, to show. Uh, I think I also find them subjectively, I also find them very beautiful, um, just considering that you gave a warning before we uh, started the, the conversation. Uh, I find them beautiful, and I'm trying to uh, um, show the same thing to other people. You know, I've, I've done um, most of my work as well on bats, uh, and I've done field work uh, with uh, Peter Nazrecki, who uh, I think you know. Yeah. Uh, and he always uh, loved when I worked on trips with him because uh, when I had my mist nets up for bats, uh, he would uh, check my mist nets, not for bats, but for insects like Katie did that would perch on the net. Um, yeah, so I, I've seen um, a lot of the insects that uh, you have probably photographed over the years. Um, but I've never actually tried to photograph them myself. Um, but in the uh, wildlife photography for the year exhibition, um, you had uh, winning photos in two different categories uh, and two other photos that were highly commended. Uh, so obviously the judges were impressed you know, with these images, but uh, what, do you, what do you like uh, about these award-winning images that you took uh, in the exhibition? Um, well, first of all, I have to say that having photos um, recognized and, and selected as winners is a huge um, validation of, of what I do. So that's something that I don't take for granted. It's, it's really rewarding. Um, but more specifically, what, about, what I like about these photos uh, that were picked, um, I think they offer a very unusual perspective uh, from what you usually get in, in um, a macro photography of, of insects and arachnids. Um, and it just so happens that if you look at the four images, oh, four of, of my images that were, were selected, each and every one of them has a very different perspective and a very un unusual view of that subject. So you have, for example, you have the, the wide view of the spider room, the spider with its babies. Um, and when I take a photo like that, a wide angle macro, as we call it, I want you to feel, I want the viewer to feel as if they are there with the spider in the same scale. And uh, I think that that worked out pretty, pretty well because the, the response to this photo is absolutely overwhelming. Um, in the other photos, so for example, we have um, the mosquito photo that also got a lot of attention. Um, usually when you, when people look at mosquitoes, they're usually look at them from above or from the side while they're getting bitten, right? No one actually looks at the mosquito right in the eye. And for me, that was very important to get that very specific point of view, uh, just because it's very unusual um, to see this insect in, in such, you know, such great detail from that angle. Um, the same I can say about the spinning spider. Normally, when you look at competitions, but also if you go over galleries of other photographers, you'll see spiders being photographed from the front, right, showing their face. And that's, that's great. Actually, before taking this photo, I also photographed it from the front. Um, but this is a little bit different. We have a butt shot here, which is very uncommon. And it's also very uncommon because the spider is actually doing something from uh, and, and, you know, being viewed from, from this angle. Um, and the same is also with the bug um, photo uh, feeding on the caterpillar. Also, this is something that normally you would see, you, you would view from above, and I try to bring it to um, bring the viewer to the eye level of that insect, just to show um, again that that perspective. So for me, this is very important, just to to basically um, bring the viewer into their world and and maybe in that way show their uniqueness and, and interesting lives that they, uh, that they lead. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I think they're all great photos, and I, I did. I sort of did a unscientific uh, survey uh, with just people that have um, that uh, have you know talked to me about uh, WPY. Um, um, a lot of them uh, talk about the spider uh, photo that we saw at the beginning. Um, uh, I'm not sure uh, that's because you know people have a phobia with spiders or whatever, but um, you know, the people that I've is, talked to, they, they, they've mentioned this, this photo as, as uh, sort of... This photo is, is interesting because I received responses to it from every direction, and it's either people love this photo because it's just so unique, and again, the sense of scale is kind of um, uh, confusing to, to a lot of people. Uh, so e either they love it or absolutely hate it because it is scary to them um, or, you know, uh, maybe, you know, they, they try to imagine themselves in a room with a giant spider. Um, but what I like about it is that it's, it's a conversation starter. Um, it gets people to talk about what spiders, you know, make them feel or, or you know, how they see them in, you know, in, in again, the topic of this, this photo is, uh, animals in a human-made environment. So how they feel about these animals running around in, in their space, right? In a shared space. So for me, that, that, that's also very important, uh, a very important part of my work. I want people to talk about it. Uh, well, well, you also have an academic background in zoology. So uh, my next question is, uh, uh, how has this helped your photography and has photography uh, helped your understanding of the biology of animals? I would say having a scientific background helps a lot. I mean, it helps me to maybe I would say plan ahead. If I want to take a photo of a specific species, a specific insect or, or spider, it helps me to basically go in the, in the, you know, the right time of the year and at the right place. Uh, so th that really helps. And also it helps me uh, to... I would say classify what I photographed after the act, um, which is something uh, people, I think, um, underestimate. Um, if, if you want to, it's all a question of what do you do with a photo after you take it, right? You can share it online, but you can also offer it to publications, right? To books or, so if you want to do that, it is very important to know what you photographed and why you photographed and where everything about the subject um, will basically help you sell it, I would say. But it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, for, for a monetary uh, reward, right? It can be other things as well. If you want to publish a paper with those photos, it's help, it helps to know what's in there. Um, but I, I want to I stress something out. I want to um, uh, emphasize something that having a, an academic background is not necessary for becoming a wildlife uh, photographer. It sure helps. But even if you don't have a, an academic degree, you can still do the, you know, the homework before you take photos if you want to you know, chase something very uh, specific. Um, something else I want to mention that no one talks about, uh, especially for people with my background. So people who are professional photographers, but also do scientific work. Um, there is a hidden conflict between photography and science, and I will um, explain what I mean. Let's say you are out in the field or you're uh, basically out with a camera and you see something new, something either it can be a, a new species or you can observe a new phenomenon, something that is worthy of reporting. Um, the conflict is this, you can actually go collect the data, maybe preserve the specimen, but then you also lose the opportunity to sit and invest time with it to actually produce high quality photos, right? So you, you have to choose, uh, or you can, okay, spend the time with the specimen, you know, or, you know, recording the whatever phenomenon you, you discovered, um, you record it, with high definition, you invest your all your photography skills into it, but there's a risk that you either you might damage the specimen in the process or it might escape. So, and then you lose some of the data or the evidence to report it 
to the scientific community. So there is a hidden conflict that no one talks about, but I definitely feel it every time I'm in the field. There's always something that I have to, I have to, I feel like I have to sacrifice something. I have to make a choice. Um, so that's just a, an interesting anecdote. Well, again, during my travels uh, doing bat work, I, I've I've seen quite a few insects. Um, so I, I've seen a lot of beetles. Um, and I know there's like, you know, tens of thousands of species of beetles. So I, there's no way I would be able to know the scientific name for it. So I just call it a beetle. Um, but I, I sort of wonder, you know, how, you know, is it possible? Have I seen, you know, some undescribed new species of beetle? And, uh, and of course, you know, didn't do anything about it. Uh, but, but that's, you know, you know, part of the, um, I guess the amazing thing about uh, you know field research is that um, you know there's a lot of stuff that you'll see, and a lot of times if you're not an expert, you know you, you may not know you know whether this is something new or not uh, to science. Um, but I, I know another uh, passion of yours is uh, science communication. Um, so uh, so what what's the what's the inspiration for this uh, science communication, and uh, have you been able to? Uh, continue, um, you know, this type of work uh, during the pandemic. Mm, with with science communication, maybe uh, you, you need to know uh, a little bit of, of my background, so where I'm coming from. Uh, I always I always loved insects and arachnids. It's kind of always been in my life in, in the background. Uh, but when I grew up, um, liking bugs was not considered a, a cool thing, as you know, as a a child and a, a teenager, it was considered weird. Um, so there's kind of a, a stereotype that goes with it. And I can say that in very recent years, I would say maybe like the past 10 years or so, maybe a little bit more, uh, it's starting to change. And I think also um, social, uh, yeah, social media helps a lot because people can kind of group together. And, you know, if they have a passion for small animals or for insects, they just group together and they share uh, what they like. Uh, so that helps and it, it, it's changing that landscape. So it's not, it's not considered that weird anymore, uh, which is great. Uh, there will always be a, 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 you know, a, a subset of, of people who are afraid of, of arthropods or spiders and insects or just you know, dislike them because they find them um, you know, uh, disgusting or something like that. Um, so the reason I'm doing this, the, the reason I'm sharing my love for these animals and, and I'm doing, uh, the reason I'm doing uh, science communication is um, I want to tell them that they are missing out on something so amazing. Um, there's an immense feeling of satisfaction, satisfaction, learning something new or discovering something new, like, like we talked about earlier with, you know, new species, potentially new species, but it doesn't have to be new species, even finding, you know, interesting behaviors that you didn't notice before or, or uh, you know, walking in, in the area where you live and you find an insect or a spider that you've never seen before. It's, it's just so amazing. And, you know, look at the, uh, looking at the, the small details and it doesn't have to be arthropod, you know, you can extend it to plants and fossils and, you know, and, and geology, the, the world around us is amazing. Um, so that's why I do it. I try to share this with other people and I hope they join in because it's just so much fun. Uh, yeah, well, I, as a uh, part of your science communication, uh, I know uh, before WPY, uh, you had an early association with the ROM uh, in the popular Spiders, Fears and Fascination exhibition in uh, 2018. Uh, so what did you do for this? Uh, I, I sort of remember something about uh, venom milking. Yes. Uh, you know, the, the spider exhibit was something very unique um, at the time. And um, yes, I was, my position there was um, mainly of a, a, what we call a spider wrangler. So I was taking care of all the live spiders. We have many, many species of live spiders in the uh, exhibition. And a few times a day, we were also milking venom from the spiders. Also, first to show people how it's done, but also to uh, send it later to a lab. So there was scientific work um, happening right in front of the visitor's eyes, right? Uh, so that was very unique. And um, 
another thing that this exhibition did very well was, um, you know, along with, with providing immense, uh, you know, a lot of information about spiders and, and their diversity and behavior, uh, was having an expert in the exhibition space. So whether it was whether it was me or the person who worked with me, the other spider wrangler, um, visitors could come to could come to us with questions or concerns that they had about spiders, and they could also come and, and you know show us photos of something they saw in their homes or backyards, and you know we could talk about them, talk talk about what whatever they saw, and you know about spiders and how it relates to their lives, and this had so much impact on the visitors um, that uh, even even nowadays uh, which is i think four four years since the, the spider exhibition uh people still recognize me on the street and they stop me to talk about the spider exhibition and how it impacted their lives so uh, i i think the realm needs to to have more exhibitions like this but i'm not in a position to uh to say something like that um uh, but it was it was pretty amazing uh, yeah, I, I remember that spider exhibition too. Um, I, I, I know there's a lot of people that, you know, you know, some have fear of it, but I, I think the people that did go into it, um, I, I think they really loved it. And I think they really learned a lot about it too. And, and they also liked, um, you know, sort of the uh, in exhibition um, uh, sort of demonstrations uh, or, or displays that were also part of that. Um, yeah, so I think uh, my last question, uh, uh, to wrap it up but before we get to uh, the audience Q&A. Um, so I, I know some of your award-winning photography has been uh, done in your own backyard, um, but you've also uh, been to some exotic locales. Uh, what, what are some of um, your more memorable photographic experiences outside of Canada? Um, I would say every, every, every photo has a story behind it. And uh, <laughs> if you're asking about the most memorable experiences, well, they're usually associated with getting hurt in the process of taking the photos. Um, being a wildlife photographer is not a glamorous job. Uh, you, a lot of the time you find yourself deep in the mud or photographing in the pouring rain. Um, and yeah, it's a part of the process, but you, know, you get to experience those, uh, those amazing moments with, with the animals. So it's great. Um, I can share a few stories. I mean, I can uh, remember one time that I was in Ecuador. I was um, photographing this teensy, teensy moth. Uh, it was very special to me because that moth was, uh, you know, it, it had something going on there uh, with, with its camouflage and everything. So everything was set up. I had my light set up and I was flashing away with my camera. And all of a sudden, this white witch moth comes crashing into the whole set. Now, if you don't know, a white witch is one of the largest moths in the world. It has a wingspan of close to 30 centimeters. So it's bigger than most songbirds. Um, and it just comes and it crashes and it ruins everything. Uh, but it's a white witch moth. So of course I was happy. It's, it's something you don't see every day. Actually, most people don't get to see in their life sign. Um, but yeah, sometimes you'll have you know, situations like this that you have to, okay, what do I do now? So I have to ditch this tiny moth and photograph the, the bigger one, or do I leave this one for a second, uh, you know, for a second session? Um, so yeah, that, that can be interesting. Uh, by the way, the photo that you're seeing on the screen right now, that's a predator located it from Israel. So for example, the story behind this photo is that I searched for this animal for hours in the scorching sun of, of the Golan Heights in Israel. It was, I think, 45 degrees uh, Celsius at the time. It was really, really difficult. And right when I was about to leave, <laughs> I was really desperate at the time. Uh, I was about to leave and I bumped into the, the, the insect and it's just majestic. And you can see exactly what I said in the beginning of the conversation. In this photo, it's a wide angle macro photograph. I want you to feel that you are there with the katydid in the field, and you know you're both looking eye to eye, so that's what I try to to communicate it with those with those photographs. I think that those insects are absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, I, I think um, a, a lot of times, um, like even in my own photographs, uh, you know, sometimes things uh, end up looking, you know, sort of 
ironically, like, you know, very nice. Um, yeah, so a lot, a lot of times it's hard to capture, uh, you know, all the mud, like even sometimes mud looks good in a photograph. Uh, yeah, so I, I think um, uh, a lot of times people, you know, think oh, these, these are beautiful photographs, um, but um, sometimes uh, the experience that you're talking about, how you got that photograph, I think a lot of times that gets lost. So you have to sort of explain, yeah. well, the photo looks good, but I had to do this to get it. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I, I think um, I, I know there's a lot of questions. Uh, I see the Q&A box filling up, but I, I've also seen a few questions uh, that appeared in the chat. Um, so if you want um, uh, uh, to get Gil to answer some of your questions, uh, please uh, type them into the Q&A uh, box. Um, so I'd like to, um, I'd like to thank uh, Gil for uh, joining us for uh, today's program. Uh, and then I hope that the audience uh, will be able to visit the Rahm special exhibitions, including Wildlife Photographer of the Year, uh, that is uh, uh, now at the museum. Uh, yeah, well, 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 basically now that the museum is open again to the public, uh, hopefully people can get in to see the exhibition, uh, not only WPY, but the other exhibitions. Uh, yeah, I forgot to mention in my background, uh, I'm giving you a sneak peek if those of you who haven't seen the exhibition yet. Uh, yeah, so th this is um, the, uh, the a photograph of the current uh, exhibition uh, near the uh, uh, near the entrance to it. Uh, so uh, for the remaining time, uh, Gil and I will be uh, answering your questions uh, for the next few minutes. Uh, so again, just as a reminder, uh, questions can be submitted by the Q&A feature uh, on your screen. Uh, okay, so this, let me open up the Q&A and um, let me go through this. Uh, okay, so I'm going to start at the top of my list here. Um, uh, so the first question is, uh, uh, did you use photo stacking software? So I, I think, uh, I, I guess with some of your macro shots, I guess, you know, how, how do you get the, the focus so crisp and clear? Yeah, um, I do use focus stacking, not on every photograph, but um, Usually when I photograph very, very small subject, then the depth of field, the, the part of the photo that is in focus is extremely shallow. Uh, so to get just a little bit of detail, I, I do photo focus stacking. I don't really use a software for this. And I think I'm, I'm the outlier. I, I'm the minority among photographers. I do it manually. Um, a lot of photographers use either Photoshop or, or Helicone or this and or Ziren Stacker. There are many, many, Zerene Stacker. There are many, many good softwares for this, but I prefer to do it manually. This way I control exactly what part of the photo I want to, to be uh, in focus and, and on where the emphasis in the photo is. Um, so that's how I do it. Yeah. Okay, uh, the next question is, uh, I'm trying to photograph bioluminescent worms. Uh, can you offer any advice uh, on taking photos in low light levels? So that's a great question because the light that is a great question and it's problem. extremely yeah. challenging with bioluminescence. Yeah, I didn't I didn't even mention that's another amazing experience. First of all, to experience that at all in, in the wild is amazing, but photographing it is extremely difficult. Um, with bioluminescence, there are two things you can do. First of all, slow shutter speed or long exposures. So having this, the camera sensor basically uh, exposed for a, a period of time to collect that light information. Uh, the problem is you also introduce noise and into the photo. So it's a little bit challenging. Um, there's another way to do it. Uh, if you do just that, if you do just long exposure, then you just get the, just the bioluminescence, but the subject the animal might not be recognizable so that can be an issue a way around that is to have a lone exposure so to again to let the sensor collect the the bioluminescence uh data i guess um but at the end of that exposure fire a very very low uh, output flash and that will illuminate the subject just a little bit, just to make out, you know, just to make the, the, the outlines out. Uh, and you will also have the bioluminescence. So you can experiment with that, but it does require a lot of patience and experimenting. So eventually something will work out. Uh, yeah, great, uh, great tips. Uh, Cause I, I'm, I'm learning stuff myself right now. So this <laughs> is very difficult. Uh, okay, so the next uh, question is, uh, 
uh, do you do any checks on images, especially for scientific use, to make sure the colors are uh, accurately captured? Sorry, so the question again? Um, do you do any uh, checks on images uh, to make sure the colors are accurately captured? So what, what type of adjustments do you do oh, um, color, for color? color. Yeah. Um, I, in my photos, I don't enhance the colors too much. Um, I, I, I guess I'm fortunate that after, uh, you know, after several years of experimenting with, with um, flash photography and my, my own setup of, of uh, flashes, uh, I'm able to reproduce the colors that are in, in nature. Um, so I don't need to correct too much. Um, the only corrections I will make with, with, you know, in terms of, of colors in the photo is when I'm photographing um, UV inflorescence. Uh, uh, sorry, U UV fluorescence, not fluorescence, that's something else. Um, uh, UV fluorescence. So sometimes the sensor um, picks that up in a different color. Uh, it depends on the, on the subject. Uh, it can be green or yellow or, or Purple, it really depends what you're photographing. Sometimes it's red. Um, so then in post-processing, I'll sometimes tweak to the way I remember it from, from photographing uh, uh, the subject. But that's pretty much it. I don't change the colors. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, next question. Um, uh, any insights on why people, uh, uh, like the uh, person that posed the question, have phobias? Uh, and how have you found the beauty and wonder of these small animals? So, so I guess the first question is, did you start off by having phobias or, or did you just love these animals right off the bat? I, I never had a phobia from, you know, um, or arthropods. Uh, I totally understand though where it's coming from. So every person is different and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to make an analysis here about the, the different reasons. It can be, you know, some past trauma related to, to these animals. And it can be a sense of loss of control because they don't know where it's going to run. And it can be a lot of things. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I am working towards, and I did this in the spider exhibit at the ROM, but also in my uh, other activities, I sometimes do bug days and I do you know, public events, uh, is to talk to these people to make sure, you know, to, to try to find out what is, the exact thing that they're afraid of. Uh, I don't necessarily um, communicate it in a way that um, um, you have nothing to be afraid of because every, again, every person is different, their experience is different and they have their reasons. Uh, but what I, but I do, what I do try to do is um, show them that some people do appreciate these animals, um, they find, and myself included, and they find the beauty in them and, and, and in their, you know, interesting, again, interesting biology and, and lives. So the reason I, I'm expressing it in that way is to show that it is possible. You don't have to fall in love with, with all the insects. Uh, for example, with my mosquito photo from Wildlife Photographer of the Year, I'm not expecting people to suddenly fall in love with mosquitoes, but um, I do expect them to pause for a second and think why they hate mosquitoes so much, why, why they think they are disgusting or ugly. Um, it is possible to look at them in a completely different way, um, but it's a, it's a switch you have to, you have to make. Uh, so uh, what camera and lens would you recommend to an amateur photographer uh, to photograph insects? Tough question. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very common question. Um, I would say, you know, if, you, if you're looking for a specific brand, I, I use a Canon, but it's not necessarily that I recommend just Canon cameras and, and, and lenses. Um, actually, some of my gear is completely brandless or, you know, unknown brands. Um, the gear itself is not really important uh, as long as you are comfortable using it. So you have to get used to the camera and the lens. Uh, so I would start with something actually quite simple because, you know, the more uh, advanced professional cameras, they can be really confusing. Some, some, of some, some of the times I don't even understand what this, 
machine can do. There's a lot of, of things packed in there. Um, it's best to start with something pretty simple and just work your way up and learn um, learning you know, how, to, how to use it. In terms of lenses, definitely, if you're interesting in, interested in insects or arachnids, definitely some, some macro lens that has one-to-one -one macro uh, capability. If you can do more, that's fine. I would not recommend, I'll show you. So this is my camera and the lens right here is actually a very, very difficult lens to use. It's, uh, it has a magnification of up to five times life size. I would not recommend that as your first lens. This is really tricky. It took me around four years to learn how to use this thing with many, many failure, failures in the, along the way. Um, one to one macro is fine. There is now another lens um, or actually a few lenses in the market that goes two to one. So twice life size in their magnification. They are excellent. Those lenses are absolutely amazing. Um, slightly more difficult to use, but I definitely recommend. Actually, they are my go-to lenses right now. Uh, they're just so versatile. Uh, you can do some regular landscape photography or portrait photography, and you can also do uh, some extreme macro if you take them to uh, two to one uh, magnification. I hope this helps. I mean, this conversation can go on forever, but hopefully it, you know. it, it helps a little bit. Yeah. Uh, how do you capture um, your photos uh, without disturbing the subjects? So mm. Another good question. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And that's where my, I guess my, my um, uh, background in, in zoology and animal behavior comes in. Um, there is no, there's no replacement. You have to know your subject and uh, know, not necessarily, you know, stalk them, stalk the subject, but, uh, but more, um, something more like uh, know their responses, how they will behave to your presence and what, you know, what the subject will do if you disturb it. Um, so that, that takes some preparation before I go out uh, shooting uh, arachnids or insects. Um, if you're shooting um, flying insects, um, then definitely the gear also comes in mind. So you will need a longer lens to, uh, to basically shoot from a distance uh, and not you know, scare them away. Uh, so if you shoot uh, butterflies or dragonflies, a longer lens will be helpful. Um, I don't, I actually shoot terrestrial, uh, mostly terrestrial um, um, arthropods. So for me, a shorter lens works fine. Um, but I will say that sometimes the subject response is what you want. So, um, so sometimes, not always, we don't like to disturb the animals, but sometimes a defense response is very, very eye-catching and it's very useful for for communication, for showing the, the beauty of the animal or, or some of its, you know, of its uh, struggles to survive, right? Uh, so it, it really depends on what you, um, what you photograph, but definitely study your subjects. If you can do that before going out uh, on your shoot, uh, definitely, I recommend. Uh, so uh, another um, uh, sort of related question, um, describe how you come to the decision of how or whether to take a photo uh, Ooh, that may wow. uh, sacrifice, for example, the antenna for a close-up view of the body. So I guess, uh, how, how do you go about deciding how to frame your, your picture, I guess? That is such a good question. Um, and maybe I'll start by saying most people who join me on, you know, hikes and photo shoots are actually surprised how very, you know, how very little you know, or, or very few photos I actually take. I really, you know, try to think about it. If, if that photo, you know, shows what I want to show, I try to plan ahead. I used to be, it wasn't always like that. I used to be a snapper. I would photograph and document everything. But then I thought, okay, I need to find a purpose why I'm using, you know, why I'm using the camera and, and what the, the purpose of the photo. So now I photograph a lot, a lot less, um, but every project is, on point and very specific. So how I make the choice? Um, I guess it depends, it all comes down um, to what I want to communicate. If I want to communicate a, a, a specific uh, life story of, of this animal, 
uh, or you know some interesting aspect in their biology. Um, so then you know I plan for a certain behavior that I want to show or an interaction with another species maybe. Um, and framing, you know, composition framing. I guess you know sometimes you have a plan. So for, for, for the mosquito photo, for example, from from the YP, um, WPI, um, I had a plan to get that specific shot for years, and I failed and failed again, and I tried again and failed, and uh, yeah, it took four or five years to get that particular shot because I wanted th that frame of the you know looking straight at the mosquito with that symmetry, with the lines and legs. Um, yeah, so this, this was really, really challenging to, to take. Um, th there's a, a great, you know, a great sense of, of uh, reward to have a vision and then make it into reality. Uh, but sometimes it doesn't work this way. Sometimes you have to remember these are wild animals. So they have their own um, perspective and, uh, you know, they're also trying to survive and they have their own struggles. So sometimes it doesn't work the way you plan. Um, then you try again, or you live up with what you did get. Um, yeah, it's, it's a process. It's a long process. Um, that's what makes wildlife photography so challenging. And I'm only talking about, you know, the smaller animals, arthropods, insects, arachnids, and I'll probably lump frogs, you know, amphibians and reptiles in it too. Uh, but there are whole sort of, of challenges even when you photograph larger animals i mean again you have to keep your distance you don't want to disturb any natural behaviors to maybe you have to use a hide and then you just sit there for hours and sometimes nothing shows up so yeah it's, it's a lot of experimentation um it's also an exercise an exercise in patience um and um it's fun though <laughs> it's very rewarding when it works that's, that's a sort of segues into the next question. Uh, how do you control for motion, wind, or other challenges in the field? Control for motion? Yeah. yeah is other uh, there's a technical, ap technical um, aspect of it. You can use uh, a high shutter speed or a very short duration flash that will freeze the motion. Uh, but if you're, so that, that's going to freeze the animal's movements. Uh, but if you have shaky hands, that can be a problem. <laughs> I'm not saying it's impossible. I mean, yeah, you know, I've been in situations where I was exhausted from the day, from hiking, from doing work, uh, and I found something interesting. Um, <laughs> sometimes I don't like to admit it, but sometimes spraying away with a camera, uh, just you know, shooting a, a series of consecutive shots, um, it helps. So sometimes you know, you get a, a series of shots, but one of them will be just crisp. Um, it's not something I do a lot, but it's another way to tackle that challenge. Um, but yeah, there are many, many ways to, to deal with it. Another way is to, again, know the subject and know when it's going to be less active. So maybe, you know, right before it's, you know, stops activity or you know, when it's not jittery. I don't know. It, it's actually easier to explain with birds because birds have really, really strict activity pattern. Um, but yeah, some insects are like that too. So some insects are active during the day and some are during the night and some sleep during the night and some sleep during the day. So you can play around with that and capture them when they're not active or least active. But that's going to get you to a different type of photo. If you want to show behavior, you're not going to get any behavior when they're not active. So it's a choice. I think you've sort of touched upon it already. Um... Uh, and and I, th I think this is going to be our last question here because uh, we're getting uh, pretty close to the end of our time. Uh, so what are good ethical practices in shooting uh, arthropods? I, I, I guess any, uh, any natural yeah, yes, organism. That's, that's a great question. Um, I, these days I shoot everything in the field as much as I can. Um, natural behavior, natural habitat. I want people to see where these animals live and, you know, again, how they interact with their environment, other species, you know, also with plants, species that are uh, in their uh, habitat. Um, but I also do a lot of, um, let's say, 
artificial background photography. So a lot of white background or black background photography. Even when I do that, I try to do this in the field. This is the best way to do it. Um, you just bring your background, whether it's a white piece of acrylic or black velvet or whatever you can use as an artificial background. And you don't touch the animal, you just place it behind the animal. So that's another, that's another uh, way to, to, uh, to do that. Um, very rarely I will photograph something in captivity and usually it will be either um, a, a, a species that is already in, in captivity in lab work. So, you know, at universities or, or institutions or something that I keep as uh, it's something I don't talk about much, but I'm also a, a breeder of arthropods for display purposes. So sometimes I'll photograph uh, the species that I breed and, and keep. Um, but yeah, I think uh, there's no right or wrong way to go with it as long as you do not harm the animal. So these are invertebrates, don't refrigerate them. It's unethical, it's not very nice and you won't get any natural behavior out of this. Um, no, try, try to keep it natural um, and um, don't, don't scare them too much <laughs> because they're also, I mean, they have their own, you know, they have their own lives and they just want to live just like us, right? They want to survive. So try to, try to minimize the disturbances and uh, let them go when you're done. Okay, well, uh, we could go on for another half hour because there were a lot of questions that, that we, unfortunately we couldn't get to. Uh, but uh, thank you all for joining us and uh, thank you to uh, Gil Vizen for sharing his expertise uh, and experience today. Uh, a reminder that uh, the Wildlife Photographer of the Year exhibition is on now until May 29th. We hope to see you again for our next digital program. Details of all upcoming Ram at Home online programs can be found on the museum's website and our social media channels. So thank you again for joining us and have a great afternoon. Bye. Thank you.